All right, we're recording. We're live. Uh, the King team is working on the video there in Spain today, believe it or not. This guy's there she is. There she is. The best the, the best information technology uh executive in the planet. Look at her. The view oh. from the window. Ooh, we don't see much, but it's gorgeous. You see a uh, Coruña. Oh, Coruña. La Coruña in Spain. Oh, nice. There it is. Gorgeous. Very All right, nice. I'm, going to, I'm going to hand you to the master. It looks like you can participate. You should really do it yourself because she's got, she does all my thinking for me. There are, well, you know, let, let, let me, let me kick off things and you look very dapper with that shirt, Llewellyn, I, I like it. So we are, are you on, so bothered about my clothes, Kavala? I, we, we are I on June. If you paid me more, I could afford better clothes. You look very dapper. You look very dapper. Wednesday, June 26, we're on the Digital Roundtable. We got a great guest today, uh, broadcasting from all kinds of places, including La Coruña, Spain. Uh, but before we get going, let's have our own John Sibley Butler play mm -hmm. some music. Right, let's go. Sibley of New Orleans. <laughs> Big, big, biggest. Monday morning rail. Fifteen cars and fifteen lonely passengers. Three conductors and twenty-five sacks of mail. All along this southbound Odyssey, the train run by. And the key. All right. Thank bravo, you, Johnny. Bravo. The, the train they call the city of New Orleans? <laughs> it's a great, great song. City of my birth. So, so J John Butler, how are you doing? What's going on? I am doing absolutely fine. I've been paying a lot of attention to to energy issues around the globe, and what's really interesting to me is is the is is the South China and the and the, I say the South global continent, where you know where there's Australia, and uh, and Vietnam and et cetera, and just looking at what's what, what's happening there, and and wondering how all of that could happen. I might add, without war. And what would be the ramifications for our economy, as as China as China has already risen in my in my in my uh, in my in what I in the way I think about it, and I'm just thinking about the world because you know we live in a we live in a global economy now, and that includes energy. So I've been thinking a lot about that, and I think it's very very interesting to take a look at the segments of the world, if you will, and look at how how, how not only energy but but enterprises around in energy will develop. That is, what what happens when when uh, when Israel uh, and Palestine that that conflict goes on? And the question is, you know, how how will it affect us and our energy, whether it's oil and gas or whatever, whatever have you? Another thing I've been paying attention to is the heat. I mean, wow! In Chicago, lots of people were dying in Chicago uh, because of the heat. And again, it comes back to energy, except I think in Chicago, uh, a lot of people did not have air conditioning. And so that's very, very good. And then we have the traditional stuff that's going on, uh, such as the stock market and all of the enterprises that are developing. As we've said on this program before, Andreas, I cannot believe the number of startups around energy that's, that's occurring now. It's just absolutely amazing. And of course, a lot of it has to do with data analysis, a lot of it has to do with storage. And I think, Andreas, in my opinion, there's a kickback, if you will, on, on your great automobile, on your F mm -hmm. <laughs> electric automobile. Uh, I just think that people are, are kicking back on it. I think that uh, Tesla have tons and tons of automobile. And then as, as, as China does this thing in the global economy, we got all these things that with blockades, or not blockades, they would keep you know the very very inexpensive uh, electric cars coming from 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 China, so all of this together and boils into the election uh, 
the election that's coming up. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that debate tonight. I see that the president is forgiving everything. He forgave another group today, uh, whether it's students' loans, whether it's uh, men between sex in the military when they were kicked out. Uh, so I think he's forgiving everything. But the big issue is this. With all of the energy stuff that we talk about, how will China continue to increase its networks in the in the in the lower half of the of the continent because it is doing a tremendous job as i've said before he was a country in one generation that uplifted billions of people uh to to uh to middle class and so it's a lot going on but i think the election now takes center spot for this week got it got it Llewellyn, what say you well i'm i'm fascinated uh always by energy, as you know. And uh, energy was the first truly globalized commodity uh, in large scale trade. It was energy and it started back in the 30s uh, with this thing called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company founded by a man called Winston Churchill, which uh, turned itself into Aramco and uh, he got out of the oil business uh, he did, though, convert the Royal Navy from burning coal to burning oil, and that's why he was interested in oil, because it uh, was much easier and much more efficient and better heat content uh, for the ships at the time. I, I am most interested at the moment by the tsunami of new technologies that's coming at us. In the next decade, the energy world will be transfer transformed by technologies that are now in the wings. They're not technologies that are on the dream stage. They're beyond that. I spent a certain amount of time up in Massachusetts uh, around uh, the companies that spin out of uh, MIT. Uh, first, I looked at very impressive uh, battery storage using Iron Air, uh, another MIT discovery or perfection. And then I've been there with a fusion company called Commonwealth Fusion Services, which is financed with $2 billion and still taking money, uh, all of it private, uh, in a huge effort. They think they will have their first machine operational next year. And within a decade, they will be able to provide, they don't like to call them reactors, but uh, devices, 400 megawatt electrical devices to anybody who wants them. And the chances are the first acquirers, if it all works, will be not necessarily utilities, but technology companies, which are grasping to have a reliable supply of energy for their, <coughs> for their uh, <coughs> data centers. So it's a new world order across the board. I see things coming along, new connectors, which will carry a much greater electric load. I'm doing a conference, one of these virtual press conferences I do for the United States Energy Association on the 10th of July, looking at seven or eight new technologies that can be expected in the electric space in a decade. Not dreams of what we'll do in 2050, but things which will start changing. And I'd just like to leave this thought with you. If the fusion people are right. If they can now build a, an operational machine, what does that do to traditional nuclear? What does that do to small modular reactors? The attraction of fusion is there are no there are no uh, fission products. The machine itself will get quite hot, but nothing else. Uh, so it's um, a really amazing leap forward if it happens. Now, not everybody thinks they can pull it off. Uh, no less a person than John Helgren, who was <clears throat> the science advisor of the White House, wrote me saying I was wrong. It's not going to happen. I did a, a program on fusion with six people. One said they could do it. Five said they couldn't. I think they can. But I'm a journalist. I'm not a technician. But we are on the cutting edge of tremendous changes occasioned by technology all along energy and technology have been in lockstep from the creation of the first steam engine 
or the addition to the first steam engine of a condenser, which made it a viable machine, uh, all through when we were in a terrible gas crisis in the 70s and 80s, technology in the form of 3D seismic horizontal drilling better drill belts and a better uh, um, uh, emulsifier down the hole and changed everything. Fracking arrived, plentiful oil, plentiful gas. So technology always comes to the aid of energy. They've been in this lockstep. Sometimes the need is greater and the supply is not there. I'm going to be writing a thing in a book for Sandia National Laboratory. I was out at Sandia in the 70s and 80s when they were experimenting, experimenting with solar power. They didn't know how to do it. They, they thought you did it with power towers and mirrors, so-called uh, th uh, thermal power before the development. I noticed the Economist magazine has gone crazy for solar power uh, and believes that electricity will be generated globally with solar panels in a very short time. I think it will be very important, but that's totally dependent on the storage technologies taking a huge step forward. I think it will happen, but we haven't seen it. So technology is on my mind at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I wanted to share my screen real quick before we introduce our guests, because you know this is all usually timely. Hopefully you can see my screen and what I'm trying to show you guys is that one of the big drivers of electrification coming forward is the rail system. And so this is a shot of the current rail system, the Amtrak, the Kansas City, BNF, United <laughs> Pacific lines across the U.S. But more importantly, the Department of Transportation just announced the biggest project uh, that has been funded by this administration starting with the rail, uh, speed rail system that was going to be LA, uh, uh, Vegas. Uh, it, these trains are going to be running at 220 miles per hour. Brightline is the name of the company that is driving this. And you can see this, this high power, um, you know, bullet speed type train system. It will be all electric uh, and it will spearhead and kind of drive a new transformation. And obviously, you know, none of this can happen, I may, I may add, unless you have the networks to deliver all this stuff. So we are lucky to have um, Dave, Dave from EveryNet, and this is EveryNet's webpage that you can go check out. But more importantly, this is their network in the U.S. And, and, and obviously, you know, the U.S. is a big place to connect. They have presence in many, many, many major Metro metropolis and obviously they have a big 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 presence in the austin area we happen to have a partnership with them at the texas state university and we have two antennas out of the many that they have so anyway with that say i want to switch back to to gabe and give him the opportunity to say hello uh gabe happens to be the head of the every net us and puerto rico business uh, and will be with us for the um, rest of the hour. Uh, every net builds and maintains carrier grade networks, offering fully managed ultra low cost connectivity as a service to large and small enterprises alike, enabling the, the delivery of massive Internet of Things globally. Gabe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andres, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to spend some time with you gentlemen. Absolutely. T tell us, Gabe, a little bit about you and tell us about your business in the U.S. and EveryNet, and feel free to plug whatever you need to plug to make us aware of your capabilities. I appreciate that. Yeah, so my background comes out of, uh, I've, I've been in the IoT space, the Internet of Things space for 25 years or so, um, spent most of that time working on in cellular networks and um, 13 years or so for cellular uh, mobile network operators, um, seven years for a company that was manufacturing, we were making 2 million connected devices a year uh, for, for broad asset lifecycle management solutions and had been watching for a, a long time this space uh, around 
low powered wide area networks using unlicensed spectrum. Um, and had a, a real particular interest in it for me was not so much the, the low power or the low cost, but the network longevity because the cellular networks that we were operating on kept turning over to new generations to free up spectrum uh, for higher throughput, higher capacity um, uh, solutions. <clears throat> Where most of the IoT solutions that are out there, if, you know, except for some that require video uh, or audio, real-time audio files, uh, most of them require really low throughput. And so as we were watching costs go up uh, to accommodate the higher speed data networks, um, the idea of, of having a low throughput, low cost, but very long lifespan network was very appealing. So after watching that for a number of years, I had the opportunity, um, I guess almost four years ago now to make a, the jump over into um, a low power wide area, uh, unlicensed banded uh, technology. The mm -hmm. company and um, help launch their US practice. Got it, got it. Yeah, so, so, so Gabe, let me ask you, so you do, in terms of the application, you do. I guess you do small cities, right? And um, and and you do uh, all kind of management of cities. And your idea is to provide a low cost, um, low power, wide area networks to the world. Uh, so, you, you, I mean, you, you, given, you're given, right given, given, given right how there. things are given, given how things are changing, and given the um, you know, if the Internet of Things, there would be how many billions? I mean, you can't even count the billions of Internet of Things. How do you do this? What's your business model? I mean, what? while, while everybody else is, is saying, well, you know, we don't, it's going to be interesting to watch uh, the electricity and, and your demand and supply. How do you come in and, and create a, a, a business model that concentrates on low power, wide areas? How yeah. do you do that? That's real interesting to me. We, we've got to sell billions to make uh, to make any money, right? Um, okay, so you like a Walmart, but, 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 low but, price, but, a whole lot, yeah. It, it, it's 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 funny as, as the two of you were talking, um, and I was thinking about the energy space, which I spent a decent amount of my career in. My um, my primary focus right now has really been around water, and water for several reasons. Uh, one, because when you're um, Water meters have that level of density that you need to get a, a lot of meters talking to one gateway. So if I put a gateway on a tower, those, those gateways we have there at Texas State, in theory, could support up to about a million water meters um, from a capacity perspective. Maybe not from, it'd be hard to get a million mm -hmm. water meters in that range, but but we have a, a, a high capacity uh, in, in those in those gateways. And water meters have a, a generally have a, a good density. Uh, in terms of number per you know square mile that we're covering, what have you. Um, but then from there, it's expanding out, and, and what talk, we can talk about like all of the use cases. And you know, we are very much, especially in the municipal government space and in the utility space. I think we're very much at the early days of uh, of anything that looks like a digital transformation. The number of assets that are not digitized, not monitored, not controlled is is phenomenal. And there's real benefit to doing it. There's real benefit to, to going through this process of, of of digitizing in some way, whatever that you mean by that. So you, it's obvious that you gotta have, your network has to be open, right? I mean, it can't be a, uh, a closed network like some people like to have. It's gotta be um, open innovation. Much much like uh, Microsoft was when it when it started, and and Apple was not. Yeah. Uh, so how do you, how do you do? So I could I could I could log on to your network without just go just go on, and if I had a house and just do it, and it just it's open network, right? Well, so almost. Let me let me uh, help with that piece. So we 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 build what we call neutral host networks. And um, in a we, we chose as the company chose as a technology stack, uh, the LoRaWAN uh, protocol, which um, is a an open protocol. The, the standard itself is owned by a nonprofit, uh, the Lora Alliance. And 
<clears throat> and so hundreds of different kinds of devices that do every, you know, all, performing all kinds of different functions from air quality to room presence to what, what have you. And, and so those, all those devices will work on the network. Um, at the back end, there's what's called a network server, a LoRaWAN network server that, that authenticates those devices and knows where to pass the data from them too. So if you had a, I happen to have a, this is a, a room sensor. You have a room sensor in your room at your house. You want to know when somebody comes and goes. Little coin cell battery in this thing. It'll last about, that battery will last about 10 years uh, in this. Uh, that's great. That data will come to our network. We have to know where it goes. So we send it to use this device, identify the network server. It goes to wherever, you know, whatever application you're using. So to so make a long term short, I, I can come in the front door free out of the back door, you know, all the data as you as, as you exit and you take all of that data and that data becomes the data that uh, allows enterprises to uh, whether it's, it's how do you sell more of those devices? How do you do an cetera. So it's open on the front. When going out the back, you collect all the data you need for your business model. What, what, what's great about like our architecture being uh, neutral host is one of our one of the hosts that we support is AWS. They mm -hmm. have all the back end services um, to you can if you have an AWS account developing an application or solution in there, you can just add add this device and enable it on our network, and it's right there bundled in with all your other AWS services. Good. So you're really you're re you're really selling the data, of course, and uh, that yeah. and that really uh, really allows you to go across you know a, a, across industries in the Internet of Things. You Absolutely. Know, yeah. I mean, I think that's I think that's the uniqueness of your business model. That yeah. is, you go across you you go across the Internet of Things in all industries, whether it's a camera, whether it's a, something on my guitar. <laughs> whatever have you okay you, you, want got monitor the, you want to monitor the temperature on your uh on your guitar yeah to make sure it's not getting you know too far too hot too cold we can do that's that right yeah, yeah. I understand. see I, I find that i don't think i have seen a company like yours with a business model like that so my last question is what's your competition yeah, our, our competition from a from a carrier perspective, two, two, two ends of the competition spectrum. One of them is, is of course, the, the mobile network operators, the cellular uh, device types, which are more expensive. You're, you have uh, life cycle management issues because, you know, you think about if you're a water utility doing a, a, an RFP right now, by the time you get those meters installed, if you're going cellular to the meter, you're looking at network shutdowns in the very near horizon. They're shorter than the lifespan of the, the water meter. So, so cellular on, the, on one side and cellular is better for some things like for sure um, better for uh, things that require streaming data like, like video or like real-time audio. At the other end, our competition, our primary competition is actually private networks because with the LoRaWAN uh, protocol, it's possible for you to set up a server in your, uh, on, at, at home or to use, um, you know, some other cloud service, um, but to put out your own gateway, mm -hmm. you could build you could build out your own home or your own campus or what what have you. And so that that's where we, we primarily run into competition. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you yeah. To us, you can understand the difference between science spectrum at the low end. We, we're we're losing most of. I'm losing most of Luana. You you guys also come back, Luana. Sorry, uh, try again. Uh, did you say you're using unassigned spectrum? For your I, I, so so, LoRaWAN globally operates in unlicensed spectrum primarily. It can be taken into uh, licensed spectrum. So in the U.S. Um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll just speak for our, our network runs entirely in the ISM bands, um, the 900-928 uh, megahertz spectrum. Um, <clears throat> the way LoRaWAN as a technology works, that in the U.S., that gives us 64 channels available uh, for LoRaWAN using um, you know one eighth megahertz per channel, um, and. <clears throat> 
which is a, quite a bit, quite a bit of, uh, of spectrum available for Lorwan here in the US. And that's interesting. Tell me who pays you? Who sends you a check? Yeah, so uh, typically it's uh, it could be the network server operator or our cu our customers look like um, like if, if you are buying through AWS, we just get a, a, a share back from from AWS. If you're buying from um, if you're a, a water utility, um, our customer typically looks like the, the water meter manufacturer. So it's the manufacturer, the OEM of, of the water meter who would be our customer. Um, in some cases, it's it's a city directly. If a city really wants to go big with LoRaWAN and, and we'll build out a, a, a network covering um, that city, then um, you know they can go and digitize everything they want. We have some really fun examples of that as well. What's the benefit to a city of going with you? Now, versus versus building themselves or versus you know other options. If, if versus building themselves, we. Our, our business is about monitoring, maintaining the infrastructure to support um, to support the end point. So we're monitoring those gateways. Um, we have a fully staffed 24 seven knock outside of Milan, Italy, that's watching every gateway on the network globally all the time. Um, we're building for hardened infrastructure. It, we're, we're removing that headache piece. And then, you know, for them as, as a, municipality then we, we also bring an ecosystem to to play and so you know um we did the the smart cities connect uh recently in uh hosted in, in raleigh and, and there was this tour at the park at the new downtown park in Cary, north carolina and and we took everybody out on this tour and and showed them how you know the paper towel dispensers in the bathrooms had a little um ultrasonic sensor on it so they could see how many paper towels were left in the dispensers and and uh same thing on all, on all the trash cans in the park you can see how much trash is in, in the trash cans at any time and some of the old trees in the park they're monitoring the tilt on them so there's you know all kinds of really interesting use cases once you have the network in place that um you can use for the benefits of the citizens well, it was, you, very interesting and let me, let me follow up on that it was seem to me then so you're not going if i were a builder and I wanted to be a five great buildings in Austin, Texas. So then you would deal not with me, not with the builders themselves. You would go to the to the city. Is that what I'm hear, hearing? Rather than to the builders themselves? Or how do you sell the connectivity to smart cities? So so therefore, yeah. if, uh, CMG Consulting is dealing with the city. And uh, we want to make it a smart city. And, and we go to the city council. And for the most part, they're sort of unaware of things. But then, can you go just to the builders of the of the high tech buildings as as they move along, and then once that's done, go back to the city council and say, "Let's create an entire city here with sensors." Yeah, it's a really good question. It, it, the way things have worked out for us mostly has been sort of water utility led, build out for the water utility. Then you have then you know you have all the coverage you need for the city. And then other other use cases percolate up after that, but that's not the way. Well, it's not the way it was for that that downtown park in town of Cary, um, and certainly not the way it has to be. And so, uh, we build for the customers that want to be the lead customer uh, for the network, in, in regardless of who that is. Okay, you know I'm working with a company now, uh, Kyle Landris, who's spoken at our event, our digital. 360 and it is a management system for hotels mm -hmm. and uh, don can tell you where everything is whether it's uh, where the laundry is is it being worn out where the sheets where the sheets are llewellyn travels a lot if we when he pays 500 dollars a night for a room then i'm sure he takes then he takes the bath rope you got to take something right <laughs> so, so therefore they, so they know this misapprehension about journalism as a source of wealth. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, as we move along, and let's think of different industries. I know you go across all industries. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about servicing automobiles. I'm thinking about servicing smart cities. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about servicing bicycles. I'm thinking about serving kids. Mm -hmm. Children, where are they? I'm thinking about the internet of things on books. I'm thinking about the internet of things 
on on uh, beds in houses. How do you see this ever coming to an end? To put it another way, will everything have a sensor on it? Well, I don't maybe, know. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe a different way of thinking about it, Gabriel, is can you scale from covering 100,000 things to 10 billion things? And yes. how does, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, the answer is it's, it's actually not that hard to scale because a lot of the infrastructure is in place today to, to do that. And, mm -hmm. and the costs to do it are, are, you know, continue to be just driven down over time. Um, I was going to make some wise comment. I was trying to come up with a good response, John, to uh, the things that I do not want censored in my home. But uh, the, the proper <laughs> crack was not quite there yet. <laughs> well, you better well, you better turn your cell phone off because she knows exactly where you're going. <laughs> That's right. Um, and and yeah, the, the way you know we've been in this space, all been in this space for a long time. I, I remember. Um, uh, I remember a time when I was told that I could not get a cellular connection down below six dollars per month, regardless of how little. I was trying to do a, a project that was 30 kilobytes a month of data, and I couldn't get a rate below $6 a month across tens of thousands of devices. You know, And today you'd be paying 35 cents for that. And I couldn't get it for below $6. So as, as we've been driving costs down in this space, uh, it just continues to open up business models. And so it you know, could, does it make sense to censorize all of those things today? Mm, no, not yet, um, but, but that, the, the, the things that it makes sense to censorize uh, has continued to expand sort of by orders of magnitude. Let me, let, let me give you a case, a case in terms of America. Let's just talk about mm, crime. Let's talk about crime, okay? Mm -hmm. And let's talk about putting a censor on every weapon, on every weapon that's sold, right? Let's, let's talk about, wait a minute, I got to get rid of this telephone. I thought you were reaching for your gun to show it. <laughs> Let's talk about putting a sensor on every, you know, you said we got a high crime area. We got high crime to centers. And, you know, you know, we went, went through this in a, in, in a lot of ways in England, where there's, I mean, there are every place there's a camera. So what do you stop? I mean, you could go, you could go to the uh, crime stuff to me and put a sense on stuff that needs to be sensors, sensors on. I mean, we, we now have sensors on, on criminals, you know, in terms of putting stuff on their feet and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you have a situation where you solve crime? Where if we know there's a sensor on everything, or is it just a social kind of activity that, that people will engage in? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I don't know that the, the right technology stack yet to put uh, uh, something on a, a gun. Uh, for example, why not? Why not? But you know? but, but but certainly um, a, a number of companies that are going after the um, uh, gunfire detection space to be able to triangulate where a gun has been fired within city limits um, and and be able to alert first responders, um, the police force immediately when when there's a gunshot. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's sophisticated technology to be able to. to decipher out filter out other noises and say yeah that was a gun and and i've seen some that, that are now even looking at it and being able to sort of determine what what caliber of gun that was and what direction the bullet was heading and mm -hmm. things like that i mean it, it's 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 pretty crazy um some of the things that are there and and, and all of that you, you brought up the the um uk example um you know americans have this uh, uh very um strong aversion to things that they see as invasion to privacy and the idea of of cameras watching everything make people here a, a lot more uncomfortable than they do in other parts of the world um and you can you can do that through other sensor types to to uh de detect or predict crime or to, to only use in high profile or, or high crime rate areas that i think alleviates a lot of that yeah i think also you know what i find interesting i know that when we send televisions to other parts of the world that sometimes we can see them and they can't see us. But what about the handheld devices? Now, this is the medical field, right? This is not small cities, but it certainly should have an implication for you. So I have a watch right now. Andrea's mm -hmm. watch on uh, that can tell us what's exactly what's going on 
inside of our bodies. Okay, and you've got and you've pure analog, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you got one too. I have a cheap one, and it does the same thing. So my question this is, is Trimax, and it doesn't do it. I'm, looking, go, well, and I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at how I would, as a statistician, how I would model this for certain kind of businesses. So what I see you saying is, you do the Internet of Things, and for the most part, the Internet of Things, I'm not including healthcare. It not include the interaction of the building that you live in and the kind of, you know, maybe poison that it's putting out. It hadn't talked, it hadn't had integrated um, your health care with driving. So my question is, as you look mm -hmm. at these different kinds of industries in the internet of things, can your models involve healthcare also? Can absolutely, you absolutely. And so there's, we're, we're seeing a lot, we've seen a lot over the past decade or so um, in terms of home health and particularly um, in a couple of key areas. One of them is is sort of the, the basic um, folks at home who need to weigh in every morning, take their blood pressure, um, check check uh, oxygen saturation, things like that, that, that those things can report in through a gateway in the home. Uh, yeah. we're, we've seen it uh, now in uh, several instances in discharge patients to try to help um, reduce um, reciprocity rates, right, of, of patients having to come back that, that, that even disposables that monitor their conditions for the first 48 hours and then die or for the first week or two, whatever. Yeah. Where, where I'm seeing a lot of interest right now and have not yet seen something come commercially to market, but I think is a really interesting space is on, um, is, is, is at the, the drug level and we've seen um, like pill dispensers where where they put sensors in the caps, um, so that you can see when a when a cap is unscrewed, gives you an idea of, of patients taking taking their medication. Mm -hmm. um, but I've seen even now um, a company that that's trying to to monitor it to, to each individual pill in its dispenser, so that you can in what do they call those things the the packs so you push the pill through. That they're, yeah. they're sensorizing it's each business. of those, so, they, so yes. you can see them. In, in particular, around um, opiates, uh, uh, around the um, painkillers, and making sure that that not only are patients taking them, but they're taking only one, and they're taking them at the right time intervals um, to try to address the opiate crisis that we have in the country. So there's a lot going on around the healthcare space. I think you know innovation. Well, Gabe, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, Gabe, I'm gonna give you a. A billion dollar a paycheck, but I'm not going to charge you because you're a good friend. <laughs> it looks like to me, Gabriel, you don't want you don't want to blow your own horn, but let me blow your own horn for you. I'm sure you've heard. <laughs> Gabriel, well, the, 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 the most sure. interesting thing in America now is prediction and insurance. So mm -hmm. let's go back when we were kids. You drive a car; they had just so much data. How many wrecks have you had, and etc. But mm -hmm. can you imagine? Can you imagine insurance company, health insurance, auto insurance, having all of this data to write equations on for their underwriting? So if I'm, I'm writing underwriting insurance and with all the health data that we have and the, and the health of our parents and grandparents, which by the way is all online, right? If, if you do ancestry, can you imagine going to insurance companies and creating new ways of underwriting in auto, in life, and how and homes. Yeah, so, I mean, you're talking me, in a really interesting area there, John. And one of them that that I think is, you know, I wonder about sometimes because I'm not close enough to the healthcare space. But okay. but but does HIPAA allow? Like, I would I, I imagine this world in which everybody's entire health history is put into uh, one giant database and anonymized, mm -hmm. right? Let's, 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 let's take the personal identifiable information away, um, but it's all in there. Like how powerful would that be for, with all the technology we have that can analyze data to begin to determine predictors for various health risks and, and look at the long-term um, consequences. 
it, it's fascinating. It's it's a it, it's a there's a lot of barriers uh, to getting there to where where we want to go. What you're saying isn't that far away, right? I would say right. I would say right now we could do comparables. For example, if you have data on households from the meter, right, and we have data on automobiles without calling out individuals, you can look, look at certain areas where the relationship between going to the hospital at night at a certain time or getting up at a certain time at night, mm -hmm. it can be correlated with certain kinds of health conditions with the, with the idea that if you uh, forget about paying a premium for your for your kids to drive when they're 18, uh, when they get in the car and the car moves, you just charge the car one dollar. But you do that all around the world, and that's billions and billions of dollars. So mm -hmm. I do think that HIPAA will not allow right now, but I think it's coming there. It will not, will not allow health healthcare data to be to be put on, you know, such such a database. But I also think that we can do comparables comparables and run run correlation analysis as to, you know, when I'm doing the underwriting, how many times your lights come on at night. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And so yeah, I, yeah. I think uh I want you, and when you get in that business, uh you can just send uh send a check to Lou Allen. Uh, send, send, send Lou Allen ten percent. Uh uh because uh you know I'm trying to get him up to the to the standards of uh where he should be. Lewin, you're, you're, you're muted, Llewellyn. You're muted. You're muted. Bottom, you're muted. You're muted. Thank left. God. You're muted. Thank God. <laughs> come again. Come again. As an, uh, it's a sort of regard question, but much of what you were just talking about comes within the purview in most people's mind of what AI is going to do, particularly in the health space. I've worked fairly closely with a colleague of mine at NASA, who before AI exploded on the scene after, what was it, November 22 or something, um, but who was already working on this idea of collecting uh, uh, random health data to see uh, whether a therapy here would work for somebody there or an off use of a drug here would have a beneficial effect in another. Um, and of course, that sped up with AI. What does it AI do to your business? Does it do anything? Does it enhance it, subtract from it, or irrelevant? No, it's, it, I mean, I, 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 for you and for your audience um, to say, to talk about just how incredibly disruptive AI is already being and will continue to be for the foreseeable future is, is it's just been sad, right? Um, in, in our space, very particularly, I, I, I think the two, the, if you look at the opposite ends of the extreme, meaning the, the internet and the thing, both the internet and the thing will be disrupted, are being disrupted by AI. And so at the edge, it's, um, it's about sensors that, that, that learn about their own environment and understand what things are supposed to be going on in their environment and can figure out on their own what? Uh oh. Well, his board of directors cut him off. <laughs> He's wow. got to put another. In the old days in England, we'd say he had to put another shilling in the meter. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first. He, Here he, he is. Right. Oh, there back. you go. There you go. He's yeah. back. He's I don't know what happened. I was I could see and hear you, but my camera just shut off. No um, worries, no worries. It, uh, blame it on the NSA. Yeah, <laughs> I was talking about something that was top secret. I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> at, at the edge, at the edge, it will be um, devices that 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 learn about their environment on their own and and can report on when things you know when identify what kinds of non anomalies. Anonymous, anonymous man. I guess. Anomalies. anomalies, anomalies, anomalies. Thank you. <laughs> what anomalies are, um, and that could be, you know, in a in a water meter, uh, recognizing, learning to recognize the water flow patterns for a particular house, and knowing uh, when when there's an anomaly there or when there's likely a leak in, within the house, things like that. At the mm -hmm. other end, it's take at the other end, it's taking large large data models. 
and being able to um, uh, use them for all kinds of things. I think about some of our some of the water meters going in today, for example, have pressure monitoring within them and, and being able to take the, the pressure differential around a community and um, identify likely locations of, of subterranean leaks, of small leaks, right? We all know catastrophic leaks are easy, but the small ones are, are hard. Or it's, um, well, I spent a lot of years, John, you, you, you mentioned auto insurance. I spent a lot of years in that space very directly, um, um, selling devices to, to auto insurance carriers. Um, but one of the things that I, I really wanted to, to see come to fruition in that space was um, uh, sort of looking at driver behavior and maintenance uh, over time so that I can, I, I have a complete digital copy of a vehicle and how it was driven and how it was maintained and can take that digital model and, and then on this back end, give a predictive cost of ownership going forward based on past history and compared to other <clears throat> similar models and, and, and so forth. Um, particularly as we've moved into an electrification world, uh, whether hybrid or pure electric and uh, battery conditioning becomes such a big thing and, and we still don't really have as much data as we need around um, the life cycle management and lifetime of a, a car battery. Yeah, mm -hmm. let, me, let me just give an example. I was uh, State Farms, one of State Farms major consultants for 22 years and uh, there was a device on the uh, on the washing machine that would always break when the consumer when the, when the policy holder left, so we worked with an with the engineering firm to improve devices on all uh, washing machines, and it really helped. So you were mm -hmm. right on. I mean, you're right on line and right on space. Well, let me return to a cut a question that I that I wrote down. Uh, you said uh, you know there might happen where people would get their own clouds. So right now I could go to wherever and pick up a camera system myself, right? And uh, it, it'd be independent. Of the of the network, I could I could connect it to my own network at my house, my own server at my house, and I could be sitting at a football game between Texas and M in Texas, or a baseball game between Texas and M in Texas, and I can see what's going on in my house. Do you see any of that return to the localization of networks? So, um, it it really is a, a question of. It, it gets into a lot of different questions that, yeah. that get into human character. And it, it, you, you're, the analogy that I think of is actually one very close to what you just said. Like, if I wanted to um, design, build, install, and monitor my own alarm system for my home. Yeah. Can I do that? Could I go down to, I'm going to say Radio Shack, right? Pick up coming to that. <laughs> I could go. I could. I. I could go on. Yes. I. I could go online really, really quick and get all the sensors I needed. Put get a hub that would that would talk to all the sensors. Um, set up something in the cloud that would uh, some way to monitor that for me. It would take, you know. Um, so the the question is, why do people still call alarm.com or ADT or brings home security or whoever? Who did I forget? I don't want to miss uh, um, Vivint, right? Yep. Do, which way? Which which way do you choose for your home? Do you want to do you want to be responsible for the whole thing, or do you want to just pay a check to somebody else to be responsible for the whole thing? Well, I think that's what happened in the industry. The industry took out their their local service 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 and went with the cloud. And mm -hmm. I think cloud services uh, become uh, more expensive, and I think they will, uh, you know, just to cool them. I think in the future, you might see a return to the local server and no business wants to be responsible for that service. No, no business wants to tell his customers that, hey, we had a breach and it's our fault, <laughs> you know. So I think from my point of view, I want someone uh, to examine my house from the cloud. I don't I don't want to be responsible for it. I want somebody to do, do the cameras themselves, just like I want someone else to work on my automobile themselves. But yeah. I think it is still a possibility that a small segment of that, I know, you know, can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and we see it like in our space, very specifically, the Laura Wan space, we see it today. There, there are companies that make that decision that they're going to go and they're going to 
put their own server in place. They're going to put out their own gateways. They're going to keep it as a closed network for their their particular use cases. Mm -hmm. And there's and there's uh, and and there, and sometimes that makes sense. Yeah. Um, probably won't name names, but like large oil exploration company, um, oil producer, right? Where they're in an environment where the only things that need to be sensorized within miles are their assets and they want to just put out their own, build out their own networks. That makes sense. Absolutely. And um, many, many, many companies have what we call an intranet. Like, you know, mm -hmm. my school, Macomb School of Business, we had an internet and an intranet. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, well, can I ask a question here, which uh, I think is, is of interest to me, and that is, um, you're an expert on T, which was great. Uh, but I wonder what, why did, why did everything to do with computers, with high tech, tend to end up with individual companies being dominant, being de facto monopolies? And it happens very quickly. Um, for example, we saw Google dominate the search space. Bing is far behind, uh, and things like Jeeves have just disappeared. And on and on and on, where you get one dominant player, and that seems to be the cause. And that seems to be the cause. My question really is, with um, AI, will we get one dominant provider of AI services? And if so, that one will be bigger than all others. Yeah, I'm. I'm not so sure the the gay wants to. He wants to be friends with all of I'm, them. I'm. I'm sure I want an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you the following. I can tell you the following. Uh, Elon Musk just announced that his AI company called XAI is building its own cloud with NVIDIA servers, not to be limited to working with Microsoft, which is a competitor, or Amazon. Amazon has also announced that they're coming out with their own generative AI to compete with open AI in but, Microsoft. Uh, this, this is not answering the question. This is uh, simply illustrating the question. I don't want to illustrate it. I know the question. I'm hoping for the answer. Yeah, I think I it's no too. Early. I think it's too early for for, for well. If, it's a two part question. It's a it's a will there be a clear winner and who would that be? And, and it's, nope. it's too early to, to say who it could be. Will there be one clear winner? I I tend to think that that the answer is no, not in this space. And I I, I have you know I, I think that because AI because of the large language models. And that there's multiple ways of uh, entering that data or, or gathering the, the the language inputs into uh, large language models. Um, I, I think there's going to be multiple winners uh, for a long time. I was just at a very interesting AI conference at NASA, and one of the things, and all the seven high tech companies were there presenting. It was somewhat informal, but very but on the record. Um, and they all basically said, we're making mistakes, we're putting incomplete product out, which means hallucinations and a loss of confidence, but we dare not not do it for fear that we'll lose market share down the road. That mm. implies that they think there will be a clear cut winner and that, as in so many other things to do with the internet, that the others will fall away. Remember all the companies, all the startups, everybody was so excited about in the dot-com boom, they're gone. Uh, uh, Johnny likes to talk about startups. I'd like to see who stays in the race. Yes, yes. And uh, if you stay in the race, the more risk it is, the more money you make. I just thought I would pass that on. Uh, to one of your capitalist friends. So, so, so I would say, <laughs> I would say, I would say the following: being a software computer, uh, telecom, energy guy, and teaching now at Texas State, and and doing all kinds of cool things. Mm -hmm. uh, AI needs a lot of data, and until Internet of Things is pervasive, and hundreds of billions of things are monitor and providing data, AI is worthless. So AI is wonderful right now because generative AI is looking at web pages of 
servers and people that have written papers and information about things, which is wonderful. But AI is missing the data that the every nets of the world and others need to collect. So in order for AI to be super, super successful, every net needs to be super, super successful. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree because AI depends upon what we have written. Mm -hmm. I, I like I like what you said, but I'm not sure I subscribe to it. Well, well, if there is no data, if there is no other data that when you and I write, there is no data. Uh, Llewellyn, you're talking to, should be talking to me like that, not to Andreas, our, our host. You should direct those questions, but you're not sure that you agree with him. Well, I should be directing them to Andres, who didn't believe in AI when I first raised it on this program. <laughs> what? What? You were what? very, you were very, very, uh, I, actually, Johnny came to my rescue when I was hanging out there on a limb. You were very dismissive of AI. Johnny came and saved me. I know you did. I, I, mean, I will always do that. retrieve it and check it. <laughs> but I'm sorry, Gabe. Excuse <laughs> these gentlemen. They're not serious. <laughs> but our, our guest has something to say. Our guest I want to jump in on this for just a second. And, and, and it's it's to say this. Andres, I don't... I, I don't know uh, what what Llewellyn specifically is uh, wanting to disagree with you on, but I don't I don't know that I would go so far as to say that AI depends on every net. But I will say that the heart of what you're saying is absolutely true, and and we are at a point when it comes in the Internet of Things space, right? AI is going to be all over all kinds of different spaces, but mm -hmm. in the Internet of Things space, we are early in in and and mm -hmm. let's. I know you and your audience, very uh, utility and municipal focused, like we're very early mm -hmm. in our in our journey here. And, and and the starting point right now is let's let's get better visibility into uh, my my mind right now is very much in the water space. But let's so let's get better visibility into how much water is coming into our system, how much water is billable, what's non-revenue mm -hmm. water, what's mm -hmm. happening. But let's monitor our wastewater. Let's there's um, you know legislation now that's very top of mind for the water industry around lead pipe replacement and, and finding those lead pipes to get them out of the ground around PFAs and making sure that we're getting PFAs out of our water system because that's you know I probably would Deadly. get in I'd probably get sued by the company responsible for PFAs being in uh, all our company you know, everything if I said it out loud. But let's. Let's, you know, we, we need to start with getting that data and and getting it mm -hmm. into, uh, into a, a place where AI engines can analyze and make use of it. Sure. That's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, parting thoughts. Gabe, we would like to know what's in front of every net in you for the next six months. Uh, any events, any, any new product, any new announcements? We we've just from we just two weeks ago at the American Water Works Association announced a, a new platform for um, endpoint monitoring, uh, so that we have better visibility into how devices at the end are behaving on the network, uh, which is really critical for um, stakeholders, utilities, municipalities, whoever has those endpoints to be able to see where where they have where they're having issues. So it's a it's a visualization for endpoint monitoring that we just announced. Um, and I think my my focus for the rest of this year is really on trying to figure out how to take all this good work that we've been doing with some cities and figure out how to how to deliver that um, to smaller municipalities that have a real need, know they have a need, but don't have um, don't have a, a you know, there isn't a simple like go to Amazon and buy the smart city package. And so trying to figure out how to how to get that whole not just the supply chain, but like the small SI, the small mm -hmm. that, that whole that whole ecosystem enabled mm -hmm. so that we can take some really very easy, cool, quick things that are helpful. Sure. I laugh. One of the things that came out at, at Raleigh, 
Um, pickleball is such a bizarre phenomenon to me that it's <laughs> taken over our country and we have pickleball courts everywhere and nobody knows when they're available. And it's so simple to just put a sensor on um, a pickleball court and for, you know, ridiculously small amounts of, of, of investment from a city perspective, actually deliver something to their citizens that they can see on their app, whether the courts are available right now. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so many simple solutions like that that just need to be um, packaged up and delivered. Sure. And I'm just a network operator. I'm not the one to do that, but I'm very focused on helping people get those packaged up and delivered into um, sure. they need to go. I, I very much like what you just said, Gabe, because I've often said and said it on this program that you don't need to get outside the box. You better look and see what's inside the box first and use it. So that was very eloquently said, if I might say so. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. A any any final thoughts, gentlemen? Llewellyn? Um, it's a fascinating time, uh, but it's one which is going to be very disturbing to the public. The sense of surveillance is going to bother people. It, it certainly does in England with the cameras, which are now ubiquitous. Um, I think that people are resisting uh, thinking that they can stand aside from, for example, AI. But uh, as, as Gabriel said, you know, it's a case of, as Trotsky said, you may not be interested in AI, but AI is interested in you. And we're all going to be profoundly affected by it, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the future does belong to sensors, to data, and to, to understanding things. One of the thing, interesting things that came out of COVID was analyzing wastewater to mm -hmm. see the disposition of the disease and of many other things. And I, I credit my friend at NASA somewhat with introducing that in a, a vast study that he did, Linda Redditt, and I had a small input on, on covid and the lasting impacts it's had, which it did. There are these turning points these uh, in life, these seminal moments, uh, and we don't go back again, and we're in one now. But uh, thank you so much. There, this is a, this is a this is a COVID uh, artifact that is. I know right now that my car, my CO two levels in here are at four hundred seventy eight parts per million in my office, and I'm quite happy with that. That's good. If I close that door right there, I get up to fifteen hundred in half an hour, and because I put out a lot of hot air, and that's really this. Bad. This program is a product of COVID too. We wouldn't be doing uh, this kind of remote thing. Uh, so many things have gone virtual because of COVID, and they have not reverted to in person. Yeah, well, I think that is a wonderful. Your business is wonderful. What I really like. It goes across all time and space, small cities, big cities, rural areas. And we know that as 5G spread out, then your business will also spread. We'll be able to have sensors on when water, when when uh, when the water go across streets, you know, turn around, don't drain, don't don't drown. That should that should do that for you. We'll have we have sensors on on, on all of the um what's you know, where are the lines in the airport now? Should I go to the airport? We have sense in all those things that make our lives better in cities and also make our lives better in the rural area. And mm -hmm. let's not let's not forget the mm -hmm. fact that we've always tried to measure the water, uh, the water amount in doing agriculture, at least my, my father, who's an ag agent, did. And can you imagine with sensors that connect the ag industry together in a city, in a town, so they so I could say, well, hey bear, how you doing over there? Yeah. And you know, I, I have a lot of stuff and I'm drying up too. So I think I think sensors as as Llewellyn just said, it is the future of the world, the future business, and we just gotta put up with it. Just like we put up with the automobile, just like we put up with the typewriter, <laughs> just like we put up with the airplane, we just have to put up with it. <laughs> yep. Gentlemen, I appreciate you all. Gabe, thank you for being with us. It's always a pleasure. We will follow up with Digital 360 Summit invitations. Mm -hmm. Llewellyn, don't forget to pencil down September 24th through the 26th, Austin, Texas. Mayor mm -hmm. Kerry Watson is opening the event. We have Michael Pesham, the Deputy Secretary from the Department of Energy, 
keynoting that day is going to be a dandy and a rematch of <laughs> John Sibley Butler and Llewellyn King. Not oh, we're going to be mud wrestling or we're going to do the sumo again? <laughs> we, 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 I, I'm going for the mud. I'm going for the mud wrestling. <laughs> Thanks for having me, gentlemen. I appreciate Bye. it. Thank you very much, Gabe. Johnny, Thank take you. us away. Maybe I didn't love you <laughs> quite as often as I could have. Maybe I thought I'd treat you quite as good as I could have. And if I made you feel second base, girl, I'm sorry I was blind. You're always on my mind. You're always on my mind. Okay. Woo! Take it easy. Thank hey. you, Johnny. Hey, bro, nice meeting you. Take care. See you soon. All right. Bye All right, now. I'll let you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.